Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Rogers, and I'm the Center Director for the Texas Heart Institute at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm joined in the studio today by Dr. Alan Klein, who's here from the Cleveland Clinic and just gave a terrific Grand Rounds, uh, giving us real, really important insights about a disease that we oftentimes don't think that much about because we end up so focused on myocardial function and coronary artery disease and now valves. but. It was really a wonderful lecture on the pericardium, and you've been such an incredible leader in this space. It's, it's great to have you here at the Texas Heart Institute. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure uh, uh, being here in Texas Heart. I was here roughly 15, 20 years ago uh, talking about the left atrial appendage with uh, T guided curvature, and now I'm more from the appendage to, uh, to the pericardium. But the, the pericardium, uh, um, pericarditis is an old disease, so we rediscovered, so it's great yeah. to be here. Well, thank you. So, so a lot of the people that watch this segment are individuals who are, will take whatever they learn today and they'll go into their office or to the hospital tomorrow and, and apply that knowledge. And I'm, I'm so interested in learning more from you about the pericarditis syndrome just because you have such an amazing experience by virtue of having the center at Cleveland Clinic. There, to me, it seems like they're very obvious cases of clinical pericarditis. Uh, they're dramatic. They show up in the emergency room with pain and EKG changes. But I also think there's a patient population that has much more subtle presentation. What have you learned over the span of your career running the pericarditis center at Cleveland Clinic that might tune us in a little bit more to some of those less acute presentations? Well, um, that's a very uh, good question, Dr. Rogers. Um, when it's very easy, when everything lights up, if the uh, infl inflammation is there, it's very easy to treat. But it's these nuanced cases, and um, as I mentioned during my lecture, during the COVID era and the vaccine era, there's a lot of uh, patients coming with different types of chest pain. So it goes back to your uh, clinical practice, how you were trained. You have to take a very good history, look at the, the basics, look at the examination, uh, look at the CRP, look at all the data. Uh, to try to um, streamline whether this is really true pericarditis or so-called, uh, I mentioned fake pericarditis. Yeah. Patients that presenting with chest pain thought to be pericarditis, but objectively, you don't find uh, these things. So that's, that's a big part of the practice now is these nuanced uh, cases. That's why they're being referred, you know, from far away to, to Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> they don't send the easy cases, they send <laughs> the very tough cases. Those are very hard to treat. The, the other thing that I loved, and we don't get to see very often in grand rounds, is uh, was a video of neck veins. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, you know, we all learn uh, as we're going through our training about the classic signs and symptoms that we should be looking for. But I oftentimes, at least in the cases that I've seen, don't necessarily hear a rub. Or what are, the, what are those physical findings that you rely heavily on as you're evaluating a patient to make that diagnosis? Um, so the clinical exam should be coming back. Uh, obviously, a lot of the fellows, residents, are not focusing on that because they don't have to know that. But I, I trained in Canada, so you, know, you have rural college examinations where you have to examine these patients. But particularly for pericardial disease, the um, simple as the uh, the heart rate. Uh, if you have active pericarditis, you, uh, your heart rate should be fast. And if it's 60 and holding, um, it's very unlikely that this is true pericarditis. But uh, things like um, the JVD, as we just mentioned, uh, quite crucial for constrictive pericarditis. As you know, a lot of people have a, you know, a swelling of the legs, uh, but nobody looks at the JVD uh, critically, and it has to be in the right position because these patients have such high uh, right atrial pressure. Yeah. Unless you're sitting or standing, you're not going to see the top. So a lot of the fellows will examine the wrong angle. Yes. So I said sit them up or stand them up, and then you can see the uh, different neck veins. Uh, the rub also is a, um, it's one of the criteria for pericarditis. It's very hard to hear, but when, uh, in the right scenario, it's active pericarditis, it's very obvious, um, you can consider rub. So you ask them to um, take a big breath in, um, breathe out, hold it, and lean forward, yeah. and you hear the, the, the scratchy sound. Um, it's a soft criteria, but, um, and I ask, you know, um, did you ever have anybody ever hear a rub? And they say, some ER physician says, well, I'm not so sure about that but um, in, in the proper technique. So it's good to go back to the uh, old days yeah. where the clinician has to uh, lay the hands on, take a good history, and sort this out. Uh, 
I found that one of the best places to teach our learners about a rub is to go to the post-op cardiac surgery floor uh, because at least they're fairly reliable. You'll be able to understand what, it, what you should be hearing. Right. So. That's a, and uh, even EKGs, back to the EKGs. Yeah. Um, perhaps a machine learning, I know the, uh, Mayo Clinic is doing um, ECG, um, AI things, perhaps from just looking at the EKG, you can come up with a <laughs> diagnosis and, um, uh, as well. Uh, actually, we're doing a project actually with Mayo with looking at cath films, the coronaries on the ca uh, 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 cardiac catheterization to uh, pull out constrictive pericarditis. So they're doing an AI project just from uh, AI looking at the, the cath films to, to decide that. So I think that could be the future. You know. We're going from clinical exam now to AI and maybe back uh, <laughs> as well. It'll be fascinating to see what we do with AI in medicine over the next decade. Definitely. So you, you made a comment in one of your slides and I wanted to just explore this idea a little bit more with you so that I understand. But as you were talking through your treatment algorithms, for acute pericarditis, I believe I saw that you should recommend that people don't exercise. So maybe, that, I didn't actually know, know that, and I think a lot of the people that were watching maybe don't understand that. Would you tell us, tell us a little bit about why you make that recommendation and if there's any data behind that to, right. to guide the... Uh, there's not a lot of data um, about the exercise um, scheme. But in general, from you know, uh, experience and um, expert opinion, uh, people with active pericarditis, uh, <coughs> the, um, the, when they exercise, it aggravates, it's a, it can be a stressor. So uh, theoretically, um, there was increased friction of the pericardium and the myocardium when you exercise a faster heart rate. Perhaps there's antigens that are, are produced there, uh, more friction, as I mentioned. So theoretically, uh, you probably want to calm things down. So my advice to patients when they're actively flaring would be um, you're on the injured reserve list, like a sports analogy. Uh, I often say, which team don't you like? Which player don't you like? <laughs> so just say they have an injured uh, knee. Um, they take him out of the game. You put ice on the knee. Uh, you put him on, uh, give them NSAIDs. They maybe need surgery. And you do some rehab and you get back. So you're on the injured reserve list. Uh, I don't want you to be a couch potato, but perhaps you can, you know, uh, do as much activity, walk the dog, heart rate less than 100. And sure enough, people that do this, this, um, disregard that advice, I get a call Monday morning that uh, they have a recurrence. I said, what'd you do? I, uh, I biked for 40 miles and, mm -hmm. I, uh, and I did this and that. Uh, some of the athletes I mentioned, this Dawn Staley, uh, you know, she's an Olympian. She says, Dr. Klein, you're telling me to cool it. And I'm, you know, I, uh, uh, but she dis, uh, disregarded and she, she got worse, uh, so she had to calm it down. So it does uh, bear out. We're about to do a big project where, uh, uh, actually a pilot study, where we're going to get patients Fitbit watches. Yeah. And half the group, uh, you know, they'll be, they'll be all flame, they'll pro perhaps be in all biologics. One, uh, one group, the uh, randomized fashion, will walk the dog, slowly uh, increase their activity. The other one could uh, progress quickly, and we'll look at the uh, time to pericardial worker. So we'll prove it, looking at steps and heart rate variables on the uh, digital watch to see how it recurs. But that's the biggest fight in the office is the, about the uh, uh, the lack of exercise. Now we know on the downside, the other side is that um, patients, you know, they want to, they can get depressed by not exercising. They like to go to the gym. This is something like they like to do. So on the other hand. They can have recurrence, so we have to find that uh, happy medium. It's possible with the biologics, you can actually exercise. So we, we noticed that perhaps after three to six months, that they're stable, they can start to pick up their activity. So we actually give them a sheet about exercise. Where are you? Are you stage one, two, three, or four? Are you full training mm -hmm. or just like walking the dog? And, and cl clearly, um, that's an important area. So that's a, it's worth investigation exercise. I think it's a great study and a wonderful way to use some of the remote monitoring sorts of tools that are e becoming more prevalent, I think, with our patients. The other question that I had uh, for you really was around what your strategy is to follow people after you've started a, a treatment approach. And I think I know the answer. I think you'll probably talk a bit about biomarkers and symptoms. but. What does that regimen look like after they've left your office? How often are you following? What are you following? And 
are you are you trying to get to absolute levels? Are you just looking at trends? G give us some idea about right. what that looks like in your practice. Well, if you're setting up a pericardial center, uh, you need you need some resources, or you need some you know a good administrative assistant or a a uh, coordinator, um, because once you see them and you tell them all these things that you have you know an active uh, recurrent pericarditis, it could take three to five years to heal. They're from out of state. What next? And you know, it's a lot of information. So often I do set up a, um, a virtual visit in three months with the nurse practitioner to, to go over what we planned, you know, the therapy, uh, to get the CRP set rate um, checked, um, make sure they're tapering their other meds if they're going, let's say, on a biologic. And then every six months, they come and uh, see us at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, they'll get their advanced imaging uh, CRP uh, lab test. So we, we keep track every six months, and it can go for several years. So they, you get to know the, the patients, you get to know their family, you get to know their children well because they keep on coming <laughs> back. Uh, they often, um, in the office, they take a picture of their MRI. They want to uh, see that they're getting better since it's a long-term disease. The MRI is very enhanced, like this halo around the heart and they'll see how that halo improves. So we do have a, uh, a care pathway um, on this. Uh, in our um, uh, Jack Imaging uh, consensus paper, we do have different algorithms, and we are working with ACC uh, in, a, um, in a concise clinical guideline that should be published next year on some care pathways that makes it easier for the practi practitioner to follow. But um, it's not like you're one and done with these patients. Yeah. This, is, this is a long-term relationship. Um, and you know, some people are uh, accepting of this. Some are very, you know, scared when you say be several years. So I, I usually say it's more than a year. You're going to be on active therapy, but it morphs up to several years. And so, um, the majority of patients have an acute pericarditic clinical presentation and don't have a recurrence. I assume that those are not the people you're necessarily getting referred to your clinic. For for those of us who are seeing this relatively infrequently, what, do the, what kind of follow-up do those patients need? Do they need serial cardiac imaging? And wh when do you stop? Um, so most acute pericarditis, uh, a cardiologist may never see because they'll go through the ER and they're uh, hopefully diagnosed correctly and given you know, NSAID and colchicine. Um, the, biggest, the biggest problem is the undertreatment so the most common cause of recurrent is the undertreatment of the uh, acute episode. Yeah. So that's where the cardiologists will, uh, will start to see the ones that are recurring. Those are the, what we call the complicated pericarditis. So the acute ones, maybe they're, they pre-select themselves out. They may never be seen if they're uh, treated correctly, but often they're treated uh, undertreated, and now they're coming. Now it's hard to navigate the healthcare system with this because where do you go? I mean. Uh, they go to urgent care or they go to the ERs, and you know, unless you're having an MI, uh, it's not uh, given top priority. Uh, so they're trying to go to different practitioners, their, G, their primary, their, their cardiologist, and they're, they're thrown different medicine, and often they're given, let's say, steroids. And as we talked about, you know, steroids um, is not such the best thing. It's hard to get them off, and especially if you go off too quickly, it's just going to come back. Yeah. So by the time they get to a pericardial center to a specialist, they've recurred many times, and you know there's a lot of morbidity, a lot of you know poor quality of life, and they're just trying to navigate the system. So now there's push to maybe get like so-called pericardial centers of excellence, like valve centers or centers for HOCAM or cardio oncology, uh, pericardial centers, but more specialization in this area. So last question, and that is. Um, you opened our eyes, I think, to a variety of different therapies. I'm intrigued about the biologics, the cannab cannabinoid, I think, was sort of interesting. <laughs> I think, okay. Looking forward five or ten years from now, what, what, do you, what do you see that will really change the face of this? Is there something that's, that people are starting to work on that you think it looks promising in early either in early phase trials or in development that you're excited about? So I think, uh, Dr. Rogers, it's a very good, uh, good question. So first of all, from the imaging point of view, I think we're going to um, get um, 
perhaps more miniaturization of, uh, of equipment to, to, to scan, like similar, you see a uh, handheld echo. Perhaps the MRI equipment will get much more, um, less expensive and more uh, miniaturization, uh, a smaller machine. Uh, perhaps you won't do so many scans. Uh, you know, perhaps you need one scan every couple of years. So the imaging part will probably get a little more focused, perhaps uh, not giving the gadolinium. You can maybe do team one mapping, just the, uh, the signature of the pericardium may, may tell you some things. So that's, that's one thing. In terms of the therapeutics, um, I think, um, as I mentioned, uh, every startup company uh, that has a molecule that affects the inflammasome will um, we'll, we'll get involved with this uh, area because the uh, recurrent pericardus, or RP, is a very good model. It's, you know, it's, it's been studying in the mouse, but now in the humans, anything that lowers the uh, interleukins, you know, whether IL-6, uh, IL-1, uh, could have a, um, a, a place in, in this field. So I think oral pills, you know, instead of these yeah. injectables, um, you know, big solutions of uh, CBD, if you take a pill that has some anti-inflammatory, um, it, may, it may be much easier. I think it's still going to be a chronic disease. It's not going to go away. It's, it's like, you know, like lupus or diabetes. Once you get the damage, it sets up uh, many years. Uh, we're so, we're, um, and patients may uh, do some self-monitoring. Maybe there'll be a kit that they can check their, um, you know, their, IR, uh, their CRP, uh, you know, uh, point of care, like an INR. Yeah. Uh, and and they'll, they'll track their own, their own activity. Maybe PRN uh, pills or, uh, you know, take a pill in the, pill in the pocket like in, a, in the EP. Maybe there'll be a pill in the pocket for uh, anti-inflammation. So that may be the future. Well, Alan, it's been wonderful to have you here, and, and we're so appreciative of the time you've spent. I, I know the fellows had a wonderful time uh, with you this morning, and I know the faculty who've had a chance to visit with you have enjoyed it. Thank you so much for, for joining us at Texas Heart. It's my, it's my pleasure. Good to be back here. Thank you.